So what does it mean to be a human being? Are we defined by our biology? Are we defined by the shape of our bodies? By the functions of our bodily organs, maybe by our DNA? Maybe we're defined by our brain functions. Did you know that a chimpanzee, which many scientists believe is the animal most closely related to humans, can think about two things at once? But a human being can think about seven things at once. Now, now women, before you ask why your husbands can only think about one thing at a time, please remember that many tasks are complex and might actually be made up of many different things. For example, driving a car without getting into an accident actually requires paying attention to six different things at the same time. Changing the radio station or the settings on your air conditioner might actually put you over the limit. And please don't try to read your texts while you're driving. That's way too many things to focus on at one time. Human beings can use complex tools in a way that chimps can't because many tools require thinking about many things at one time, which is probably why my wife got nervous every time the power tools came out. For the last few hundred years, most English and then later American philosophers have used the term self to describe what it means to be a human. The self, in view of these philosophers, is a sovereign individual in charge of his, or now we might say her, own life. The self goes through the world trying to impose his or her will on the people and the environment around him or herself. To be in charge of everything, trying to achieve personal happiness or satisfaction. The successful self, sometimes in our culture referred to as the self-made man or now self-made woman, is viewed as successful precisely because he or she manages to manipulate her environment or impose his will on other people in a way that lets him or her achieve his or her goals. But maybe we should look at what the Bible says about what it means to be human. So let's start with that passage that we just heard from Pastor Steve from Genesis chapter 1. As we're coming to the end of the first of many creation stories in the Bible, we heard that as the crowning achievement, the crowning achievement of six days of creation, God created human beings. Verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the earth. First thing I noticed was let us. Let us? Who's God talking to? Now, there are at least two different theories about this with some additional variations. I'm just going to hit the outlines of the, the, the main two. First, there are some scholars who think that God is talking to and consulting some other divine beings, which we might call angels. God is not in heaven alone, and in this view, God is choosing to share the creative process, especially this pinnacle of the creative process, if I can say that without sounding like I've got excessive pride, choosing to share this process with other heavenly beings. But if we read on, the Bible doesn't say that humans are created in the image of angels. The Bible says that humans are created in the image of God. So I don't quite buy this first theory, although many Old Testament scholars believe it's correct. The second theory, which makes more sense to me, is that God is talking to God's self. In the New Testament, we learn that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Christian theologians explain this, God is one, but God has three faces or persons. The Old Testament actually uses 27 different terms for God in a way that has led some Old Testament scholars and some Jewish rabbis to say that there are not just three, but 27 different faces or persons 
to this one God. If you want to go deep, which I hope some of you do right now, there are two different Hebrew words that are typically translated as God in English Bibles. One of them is singular, or literally God, but the other is technically plural, or gods, yet it is typically translated into the singular God in English. Whether we think that God has three or 27 persons or faces, God may be one, but God is also a relationship between those three or those 27 persons. So I think that God's saying, let us make humankind in our image is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit talking to each other just as Jesus talks to God the Father and is filled with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Let's pick up at verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So human beings are created in God's image. We are created in the image of God. This doesn't necessarily mean that we look like God or that God looks like us, but that we have something very much in common. Now, let's be honest. We human beings sometimes try to recreate God in our image to imagine a God who shares our ideas or our thoughts. I would prefer a God who agrees with me, a God who doesn't challenge me, a God who confirms my biases. But that's not what the Bible says. Right here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we are told that God made us, that's you and me, to be in God's image, including being male and female. That means we are built for relationship. Just as God is actually a relationship between three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are made to be in relationship with each other. And we are made to be in relationship with God. We read in Genesis chapter 3 that God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. Now, sometimes we talk about God in terms of God's attributes. God is powerful, God is good, God is righteous, God is eternal, God is unchanging, etc. But as as theologian Robert Jensen points out, this approach owes at least as much to Greek philosophy and metaphysics as it does to the Bible. And while some of those terms are used in the Bible, focusing on them can cause us to miss the relational nature of God. God is not just a relationship with God's self, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in relationship with each other. God is also in relationship with creation, and especially, as we are concerned, a relationship with human beings, with us. Some rabbis say that the creation stories describe Adam in two different ways, and that these depict two different sides of our nature. Conservative pundit and author David Brooks describes these two different ways of looking at humanity. One Adam, Brooks says, is focused on his resume, picking up the idea of subduing, ruling, or having dominion over the earth from this passage in Genesis. This Adam wants to build, wants to create, wants to produce things. This Adam wants to win, to achieve high status and wealth. This Adam represents the view of humanity that philosophers call the self going through the world imposing his or her will on people and things so as to achieve his or her goals in life. But the other Adam, Brooks says, is more focused on the kinds of things you might want someone to say at your funeral. This Adam feels a calling to serve the world, to make the world a better place, and believes that you have to give in order to receive that in order to find yourself, you have to be willing to lose yourself. Instead of imposing his will on others, this Adam wants to build loving relationships. So you can say that we're complex. We have this desire to achieve, 
to bend the world to our will. But we are also made for relationship, relationship with God and relationship with each other. Some contemporary philosophers, many of them Catholics who are influenced by Thomas Aquinas, don't use the term self to describe what it means to be human. They use the term person, and they define a person or say that a person is defined by that person's relationships. We are made for a relationship with God and with each other, and the relationships that we have help make up who we are. I'm a different person because of the relationship that I had with my parents, because of the relationship I have had with my friends, the relationship I had with my wife, the relationship I have with my children, the relationship I have with people around me, with my neighbors. There's something about our combination of brain functions that not only allows us to think about more things at once than any other animals, but there's something about our combination of brain functions that allows us to have different kinds of relationships with God and with each other, deeper, more powerful, more personal relationships than, as far as we can tell, other animals can have. Think about your pets. I have a different kind of relationship with a human being than I can have with my cats. They're really mostly concerned with whether I feed them, make sure they have water, and clean the kitty litter. And if I pet them about three to five minutes a day, and that's really about all they want. They, they don't want much more than that. I can have a much deeper relationship with other human beings and a much deeper relationship with God than I can have with my cats. Which brings us finally to our theme. You might have been wondering when I was going to get there. Connect to joy. Last week we had Christmas in July. As Pastor Bob told us about the coming of the Christ child, not just at Christmas, but in our lives, how that brings us joy. Jesus restores our relationship with God, which was broken by our sin by our self-centeredness, what I like to call our messed upness. So we can have the relationship, because of Jesus, we can have the relationship with God that God intended for us. And that brings us joy. The letter we refer to as Second John is one of the shortest books in the Bible. It takes up even less than a page in most Bibles. It's so short it doesn't even have chapters. But you get to the end of this short letter in 2 John verse 12, and we read, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Joy does come from being face to face with people with whom we have deep relationships. The Greek, would literally the Greek would literally be translated as mouth to mouth, a phrase that is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to describe Moses' relationship with God. We connect to joy through our relationships, our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. Some of you are old enough to remember Gail Sayers, the Chicago Bears running back, he wrote an, an autobiography titled, I Am Third. Given his success on the football field, you might think that he was referring to some football stat in which he was third on the all-time list. But no, he was referring to a plaque that said, God is first, others are second, I am third. This is similar to an acronym I learned as a teenager, joy equals Jesus, others, yourself. Joy, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, yourself, in that order. We connect to joy when we put our relationship with Jesus first. And then we put our relationships with other people ahead of our own interests. 
In David Brooks terminology, when we care more about building loving relationships than in, than in achieving what the world would call success. We find joy in relationships because we were made for a relationship with God and with each other. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, tells us that for he, meaning Jesus, Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. In some translations, we would read that as he has broken down every wall. Because of our self-centeredness, our pride, our hostility, our hate, our fears, we build walls. In Ephesians, Paul was referring to the wall between Jews and Gentiles. In our time, we build different walls. Walls between Republicans and Democrats. Walls between white people and people of color. Walls between people who agree with me and people who don't agree with me, because I always like to think that I'm right, so I'm going to put a wall there, right? We build walls all the time. And Jesus breaks them down. Those of us who belong to Jesus are to be one, to be united by our relationship with Jesus, which ought to be more important to us than the color of our skin or what political party we belong to. And we are also called to care for the world, including the people who don't know Jesus yet, the people who are hostile to the message of the gospel. We're called to care for those folks, to love those folks just as much as God does. We need to remember that when Jesus says that God so loved the world, he was talking about people who were separated from God. We are made for relationships. And Jesus' work on the cross restores our ability to be in relationship, not just with God, but with each other. Jesus came to tear the walls down so we should quit building them back up. Jesus tearing those walls down sets us free. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, we read, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The self, the version of humanity that wants to go through life imposing our will on people and things around us, might think that this freedom Paul is talking about simply means the ability to do what I want when I want to do it. But Paul makes clear that this isn't what he meant a few verses later. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, Paul says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So the Christian view of freedom more closely resembles the view of humanity held by philosophers who call human beings a person. Jesus sets you free so that you can care for others, so that you can have loving relationships with others. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we are set free not to worry about ourselves, we are set free to love and serve our neighbors. As Gail Sayers wrote, I am third. As I learned when I was a teenager, we connect to joy when we put Jesus first, others second, yourself third. Amen.